Um, so I'm actually a Solaris administrator who um, basically got sick of having really terrible applications dumped in my lap. So I said, I can do it better. I'm, I'm the man. So I decided to go and do some development and I joined uh, a couple of uh, Java teams and then recently got into Rails, um, partly because the Java was horrible. Um, and I ended up, uh, I guess I've got about two and a half years of Rails experience, which turns out to be quite a bit in the Rails community. Um, and I've been doing a lot of inter integration projects and I've also been doing some greenfields development. So I've got a couple of different, different aspects on this. And um, because of my history as an SA, because I taught the lingo, um, I've been mostly uh, working with traditional infrastructure departments in big organizations. Um, just to put this thing to rest immediately, Windows is a horrible, horrible platform for Ruby and Rails. It's just absolutely vile. Um, Git, which is the preferred um, source code management system, and certainly works a lot with the Ruby and Rails tools, is only barely supported. And the mini GW compilation of Ruby is so slow, it's just unreal, horrendous. Um, Linux has a very definite and perceptible performance increase. Um, the tools that go with it, you know, Apache, Postgres, Git, it's really easy stuff. You know, it's, a, it's an apt get or it's five minutes configuration. Um, some of the gems, gems are the, uh, the way that Ruby packages occur um, and Ruby libraries get distributed. Some of them have C pieces because there's a really good integration between Ruby and C. So those uh, C pieces need to be compiled and if you've tried to put the GCC stack on Solaris, you'll know what I mean when I say it takes a lot of time and it's not, it's not a lot of fun. So Linux, it's all there. It's really easy. Um, and because there is, a, there is actually a Linux community that sits around, so there are other people who use Ubuntu, there are other people who use Debian, or even some people who use Red Hat. Um, the reason, uh, one of the reasons that I did this talk is because I realized that when I was working with um, particularly some of the SAs at the bigger Melbourne corporates, that they just hadn't been taken on the journey. Nobody had told them why we started using Rails in the development community um, and why it was important. So a few years ago, we genuinely believed we could get one language and use it for general purpose computing and all business computing problems would get solved by it. Oh dear. Um, we honestly believed vendors could help and while I wouldn't like to shoot any sponsors here, I will say that 20 grand a CPU for a J2E server is quite a lot of money. Um, and it really, we struggled, we struggled to get uh, help with the J2E servers. Um, and we thought that we could do all this so very flexibly that we could scale very linearly, particularly up hardware. Um, but what went wrong was the learning curve, particularly if you're a Java developer these days, there's maybe like about 15, 20 books that you've got to read to understand things like Java directories, Java storage, I.O. And certainly understanding things like multi-threading and concurrency in Java, it's just a nightmare. Um, the expense of getting this right, um, anybody who's working with mid-range Sun hardware will know that it is quite swingingly expensive. And you don't actually get the bang for the buck. Um, particularly in J2E container managed persistence, there's a disaster going on where you've got these massive apps that supposedly do all the storage themselves and manage all the storage and it just doesn't happen for you. And also, because of the extensibility of the Java platform, you ended up with a situation where you couldn't necessarily rely, for instance, on your, um, your relational database mapping software to be one piece of software. And that, um, that extensibility then meant that everybody had to have like a thousand line XML config files. It was a nightmare. So from deciding to do a project to actually delivering even the first basic prototype took months. Um, and also, I just want to stick the boot into PHP just very quickly. Um, 
one of the reasons again for this uh, is that I had to deal with a PHP application that had a 28 page if statement. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, what happened and what's happening now is that we've, we've basically fragmented. We've, we've lost this one language to do it all scenario. And so we're looking at Ruby and Python and other scripting languages. We're also looking at things that sit on top of the JVM. Groovy is a great example of that. We are indeed looking at PHP, but I'd just like to refer you to the evil, previous slide, evil, evil stuff. We're also looking at Haskell and functional languages to give us power in big batch operations. Um, there's a guy called Ola Blinney who works at ThoughtWorks, and he's talking a lot about polyglot solutions. And I think that's probably where we are. We're going back to where we were in the 1980s, where we have a number of different languages at a number of different levels. And the one thing that's really come along as well is that we've managed to get web services kind of right. And if you look at people like Amazon with the AWS stuff, there's some really cool stuff coming on there. Um, we did learn some important lessons, though. We learned how to partition the infrastructure. Um, we learned that the internet is a, a scarier place than it actually we initially pretended it was. We've also learned a lot about storage in databases, and particularly um, databases. And the next point with the blowing the business log business logic across the platform, we overuse databases. We made particularly Oracle here um, do far too much. There was stored views, stored procedures. Um, all sorts of nightmare scenario stuff that was really difficult. It made it really difficult for us to work not only with the database itself, but it made it difficult for us to change the applications. Um, and open source actually came in and sorted a lot of this out. Like, uh, if you look at things like Tomcat, Tomcat did such a powerful job in helping us make J2EE manageable. Um, but one of the other things that happened is that we seem to stop saying that we wanted small numbers of smart people. And one of the things that I started noticing pretty quickly once I left system administration was that I was dealing with a lot of guys who literally just cut and pasted things into terminals from a wiki. Um, there was one particularly depressing day when I had to try and help a guy and explain to him that when it says angle bracket computer name, angle bracket, that actually means that he has to put the machine name in there. <sighs> <laughs> without the angle brackets, that's quite correct. Um, and there was also a, a real issue about junior infrastructure guys, and it's something that um, the guy, Divas, I think it was, uh, touched on earlier, that developers have these structures and ways of thinking that allow them to become senior developers that system managers just don't have. And certainly, that extends into DBAs and network guys. Um, and there weren't really any patterns for deploying the applications. When I came to the Rails community, everybody was just like, well, we just stick it up there and kind of hope it works. Um, and we, I also noticed that kind of the, the issue that development was effectively dumping things. And this is, this is particularly true of large corporates. What would happen is there'd be an infrastructure group and they'd sit in one room. There'd be a development group sitting in another room. And they'd never talk. They just have these little slots when one guy would go over to the other guy with a Taji's head file and say, deploy this, please. And it was a nightmare. Nobody liked each other. Nobody knew what anybody else was doing. Um, so along came Rails. And the, the first thing that you really notice, particularly if you've got any kind of budgetary or management responsibility, is that it's so much faster to develop. It's so much faster to get something working quickly um, that you can show it to somebody else. Um, it enforces some of the good patterns of development, and this is, this is an interesting thing that you can, you can hang yourself quite badly with Ruby and Rails, um, but because of the way that Rails is structured and because of the default configuration choices in Rails, it makes some good decisions for you. Um, Ruby is a great, great language as well. You just, um, when you get into it and you you can interact with the system in a, in a kind of pearly way, and you can use all the regex goodness. Um, it's a fantastic language with proper object-oriented support and metaprogramming support as well for those people that are into that kind of thing. Um, and there's also a project called JRuby, which for those of you who have Java and JVM environments, JRuby is a great way to get um, 
a project up and running and you can use JRuby to actually deploy WARS onto your existing Java and Tomcat um, infrastructure so you can do a Rails project and not have to rip up your entire infrastructure. Um, REST is encouraged as well. REST is just the most fabulous thing. I love REST. Um, in fact, you need to be very excited about REST. Um, Roy Fielding, who was one of the guys who did Apache, HTTP, yada, 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 very important fellow, um, came up with this idea, I think in about 2000. Um, he did a PhD dissertation on it, and he looked at how he could make applications scale a lot better. And one of the interesting things that he came away with was this REST model. Uh, it's called representational state transfer. Um, and I've got a link at the end of the talk for this. Um, but what it really means is that applications are structured around small resources. So um, whereas particularly in Java applications, you have these massive um, web services interfaces that are really difficult to deal with. Um, in RESTful applications, you tend to get small transactions. And those are small transactions that you can deal with um, at a caching level, you can deal with at a security level. Um, they're really interesting. And um, the caching and security can live at multiple levels. So you can have some close to the client, you can have some in the data center. Um, Rails applications are really, really simple. Each project sits in its own directory. What happens is you have a couple of subdirectories that sit underneath it. The important ones are things like uh, the log directory holds logs files. Uh, public is probably where you'd point your document root for your Apache config. Um, a script is where you'll find most of your stuff um, that you'll interact with, as particularly when you're deploying the application. And app is where the source code lives. Ruby is an interpreted language, so effectively the .rb files that are in there don't need any compilation. Um, the, there are three main options. The first one of which is Webrick, which is the pure HTTP server that lives inside Ruby. I really wouldn't. It's awful. Um, it's great to get the development going with, but when you're actually developing a serious project, you will probably want Mongrel, which is the um, Ruby and C um, application server. But quite analogous to Tomcat, really. You install Mongrel separately, and then you just run your Rails projects, and they pick up the fact that Mongrel exists and pick up the port uh, from the Mongrel config. There's also a recent development called ModRails, which is an Apache extension. Um, it looks like it's really cool, but to be fair, at the moment, particularly if you're doing enterprise development, you probably want to stick with Mongrel right now. Give it another 6, 12 months, and I think ModRails will be an excellent I idea. Um, there are some pitfalls, scaling and speed of execution. Um, I'll just have a, a quick sideways glance here. Ruby versus Perl ends up being well, kind of 1.9, 1.8 times slower than Perl. So there's a number of different um, uh, different algorithms that are tested across the bottom there, and what you get is that the speed, particularly of Perl is much better in execution. Um, that's a preface to the next slide, which sadly, this slide is really, really depressing. Uh, Sun have a, I think it's uh, one of their Niagara boxes. And you'll notice at the bottom there, the stats.rb with Ruby took 25 hours um, to do a 45 gig log file, whereas um, the C++ took, oh yeah, four. Four minutes. That sucks. But then, if you look at the lines of code, the lines of code is the really important piece in this. Because the line of code, if you look at the Java lines of code, which is effectively 2,126, if you like, 2,126 potential security holes versus 78, like that really gives you an idea of the power of Ruby and the expressiveness of it as a language. It's a lot faster to develop. It's a lot more powerful to develop with. And what you notice is that your solutions are simpler, and they just tend to work. But it does mean that there's a knock-on effect. You can't just buy a bigger box if you need to solve, solve a performance issue. You're going to probably have to get multiple instances of Rails running across multiple boxes, and then figure about a way of load balancing across those. 
Um, also, I've just recently started noticing a couple of clients who are starting to say, oh, do you know what? We could do this massive batch operation with Ruby. It'll be great. We had a good web app, and it's, it's, it'll all be good. No, don't do it, kids. Don't do it. Um, Rails apps leak memory, which is a little bit of an issue. So you will have to restart Rails apps periodically. Um, and Rails also has some of the best AJAX integration that I know of. Um, the great AJAX security disaster, I know it's there. I know it's coming. Um, certainly, if you look at the fact that Gmail is now starting to get a few holes being picked in it, like, something bad is going to happen here. Um, and the clients of JV, sorry, AJAX ap applications are just horrendous. If you've ever run Firefox and Gmail overnight, you'll know what I'm saying. It's two or three gigs. Like, what's going on there? So scaling Rails is very much, you need lots of small instances of Rails that you tightly manage. Um, Rails apps don't share state, and that's great because it means that you can put them in a number of different locations. And unlike, say, Tomcat, where you need to configure um, cluster, um, the cluster communication between the Tomcast instances, you don't need to do that here. Um, databases are really slow in Rails, and the network columns are really slow in Rails. Um, so what you can do is you can cache the assets. Particularly, there's a great uh, program called Memcached, and that will allow you to cache a lot of your stuff. Um, Rails web apps, um, with the, they have what they call actions. Actions is effectively a page view. Um, so actions page and fragments of pages can be cached, so that will give you faster execution. Um, I must admit that I've not had the success of that I've had with memcached in the the page and the pagment caching. Um, indexing engines. Indexing engines are really interesting. If you've used something like Sphinx or in the commercial world, something like Fast, um, indexing engines give you a massive speed boost because they are just about the searching. And just about the searching turns out to be what 90% of applications really bother about these days. The set theory that really drove relational databases, I don't think, is necessarily that reflected. And particularly in Rails apps, where the, the object uh, persistence model is what they call active record, which is very much one database row equals one object. That persistence model doesn't allow you to have complex databases and doesn't allow you to be clever with the databases. Um, securing Rails is actually tends to be a little bit easier because if you just take Apache and put it in front of Rails, which a lot of you will probably be familiar with from other applications, particularly Java J2E applications, it's, it's essentially a cakewalk. And proxying the requests and deep inspecting the packets for Rails apps is really easy. And RESTful apps will allow you, because you'll know that it's a HTTP port is something that's being created, or HTTP delete is something that's being deleted, you can get in there and you can see what's going on in the apps without necessarily having to be invasive to the apps with the security devices. Um, there is a file called config database.yaml uh, that stores your DB creden credentials. Um, we did have a client who unfortunately didn't separate the network very well, so there was no firewall between the desktop network and the production network. So if you accidentally run the wrong command in uh, development, you can get to the production database. So I would suggest that you separate the database.yaml file away from the rest of the development so that when you actually come time to deploy the application, you just slot the database.yaml in. Um, mod rewrite, which is the way that a lot of Rails apps uh, used to get from Apache and back. Um, if you misconfigure it, you can make an almighty mess. Um, and there is a JavaScript tool called in place editor that I had a particularly depressing uh, instance of where we'd spattered it all over an application. It turned out to be quite trivial to do cross site scripting with it. So, yeah, don't, don't touch that. Um, are we ever going to talk about deployment properly? <laughs> well, this is the basic stack. You get an Apache, you hitch it to a Mongrel, Mongrel sits on top of you, or Mongrel communicates with your database. Really easy. And this is, this is the Java equivalent of that. I've run across about 10 or 15 different clients who have exactly this. So if you just substitute Tomcat for Mongrel, job done.
you're, you're effectively home and house. You can put a firewall in there if you need to, and certainly firewalls at multiple levels there. You can put um, caching and load balancing in there quite easily. It's, it's really simple, and it's a really extensible architecture as well. Um, there is a little tool called Monit that helps you manage the mongrels. So you can use Monit to go in, and particularly when I was talking about the Rails apps leaking memory, you can just go in and say, if it's more than 150 meg big, which turns out to be quite a large Rails application, just kill it and restart it. Job done. Um, I quite like VAR web apps for where I stick my stuff. Um, it's not VAR www, so it doesn't end up in your uh, Apache default document route. Um, also, the Oracle driver, I just have to stick a little bit of a shoe in here. The Oracle driver is developed by one guy, and he's a very dedicated guy, but Oracle's a big database, and wrapping the C Oracle functions in there has been quite a painful process. So you, um, you are far better off using Postgres or MySQL. Um, again, it's open source, why wouldn't you? Um, the budget of 150 meg, sorry, budget of 100 meg of memory is really uh, a very loose one. A tight Rails app will use somewhere between 50 and 70 meg of memory, generally in normal operation. And then whenever it exceeds that envelope, just kill it. Um, the log directory, particularly when the login's turned up, can get full fast. Um, so if you use something like log, ro log rotate, it's simple. But Ruby hangs onto the file, um, the file handles. So unfortunately, you have to use it with a truncate strategy rather than just a delete strategy. Um, and the gems can be stored on a, uh, a standard web server. So what you do is all the gems that are required with the application, and generally there'll be like a half a dozen gems that you'll need, you just put those all on, on a server in your internal network, and then you've effectively you've owned the entire infrastructure for the app. You've no need to de depend on anybody else. Um, there are a couple of really cool tools for deploying Rails applications. Um, Capistrano is um, the tool that's used by 37 Signals, the, guy who's, the guys who uh, came up with the Rails, um, uh, the Rails stack. And there are a couple of, uh, they're actually Victorian lads, Mike and Marcus, who wrote uh, Deprec and Sprinkle. Uh, Deprec is great because it's just a tool, it's just a set of pre-canned scripts for Capistrano. So you can go there and you can find out how to build like an Ubuntu 8.10. Uh, Apache Rails stack, no problem. Um, and of course, Puppet, which has come up a lot uh, during today. Uh, I love that slide. That's great. Um, so Puppet, well, I guess, I don't know. I think actually a few people already know most of this, so I'm going I'm to go quite quickly over this. Um, each Puppet, uh, sorry, Puppet has a client-server configuration. So what you do is you have a puppet master daemon. Each of the little uh, puppet daemons talk back to the puppet master. Um, puppet works with your OS package management. So uh, you can use pbuilder uh, on Debian to easily create Debian.debs uh, of your pa Rails application. Um, I think you can do the same in RPM. I'm looking at the Red Hat guy going, yeah. <laughs> um, almost certainly. And what you can do, and what I've seen done recently is that you can use continuous integration in development practices and say, well, okay, if you've got a successful build of the application, it's passed all the tests, I'll just automatically create a .deb file, and then I'll just hoover that off into um, um, an apt cache mirror or something like that. Um, Puppet really allows you to deal with large populations of machines. Um, and this is, this is actually shamelessly ripped from the Puppet website. Um, but it manages the pseudo package. Like, why wouldn't you use this? It's just great. So it knows that it depends on a package called sudo. It gets the package from uh, the Puppet, Puppet Master. And it also looks after the, the, the guts of the file. It makes sure that the right owner, the right group, and the right mode is on there. How easy is that? Um, Puppet also has this great heterogeneous thing that it, it does work over multiple different uh, operating systems for so for those of you still suffering with Solaris you can you can carry on with package add um, 
There are a bunch of recipes on the wiki that are great for the manifests. Um, I think probably where I get a little bit saddened by Puppet, or a little bit limited by Puppet, should I say, is that the Puppet Master demon seems like a single point of failure. And I don't think that's great. That'd be cool. I'd love to hear. Um, and also the, the recipe syntax um, is cognizant of things like files and packages. So that means that it, it's kind of limited in a, in a way that Capistrano isn't. Capistrano has got its own downsides, but um, that declarative syntax means that you have to have a, a concept of a file. Um, so Capistrano is very closely aligned with Rails. And Capistrano allows you to deploy from the root of your Rails application. Um, this is great for where you've got a small development shop um, and you want to get it on. It's also very closely um, based on Ruby. So you can get the developers to script this thing up and make it work properly. Effectively, what happens with Capistrano is that you have these recipes. Oh, strange. They all use the same t terms. And the recipes are applied to hosts. So you'll see that there's a task called search libs, and that on each of the hosts in the list goes through, and in this case, runs an LS. Um, when it runs, it runs as whatever user that you tell it to run as. So there's a, there's a deploy.rb file that tells it which user to connect to the servers as. Um, you can also um, use sudo with it quite easily. And the task below it, which is called as root and only runs on the same host there, will run through with sudo and it will prompt you for the password or use the keys as necessary um, if you've got that configured. So you don't have to use a password. And that's really, that is, uh, that is just Ruby script. It's, it's so simple and it's so expressive. Um, there is a command called Capify that sets up your Rails project. And then literally to get the, the thing deployed, it's cap space deploy, boof, off you go. So you can stick that in um, either to your continuous integration or even if you're using uh, Subversion or Git with post commit hooks. You can just get that all scripted up so it's automatically done for you. Um, the default method of Capistrano operation is quite closely aligned with how 37 signals use Rails. So what that means is that they take a copy of what's in your source control and effectively check it out onto the server. So for those of you who have the kind of environment where there isn't an SVN or a Git client on the server, you probably have to take an alternate strategy to the default. But it's quite simple and it is actually documented. Um, it is much more project focused than Puppet. Puppet is much more holistic. Um, this is really about one, uh, one project on a number of servers, and it can, it can deal with quite a number of servers. It runs uh, simultaneous SSH sessions across all the servers, which is quite nice. Um, the documentation lacks something compared to the Puppet stuff. The Puppet stuff really, like, congratulations to the Puppet guys, it's so good. Um, and it can be difficult to debug what happens on a remote SSH session. We did have a, a, a little incident where the, the SSH, uh, sorry, we got a Capistrano recipe that dealt with the firewall, and that blocked out the SSH. It's hmm. a common theme today. Um, <laughs> so there is a little bit of stuff that I also wanted to just rant about quickly. Um, in the, I noticed particularly with uh, a couple of the departments that I was working with, that what was happening was the sysadmins were basically sitting around waiting until the end of the project and then going, oh my god, this thing's arrived and I have no idea what it does. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of really start a pushback movement. I think it's okay for you as a sysadmin to turn around to the developers and say, you have to test this thing properly before you give it to me. And in, uh, in Ruby, there's quite a lot of support for code coverage and code testing. The, the Rails framework does a lot to push in the testing and make it, uh, make it a, a normal part of Rails development. So you can use code coverage and you can tell how much of that Rails code has been tested. Um, there is no reason why your developers should not be doing that. Um, I also uh, work with a tool called CCRB, which is a Rails, um, a Rails continuous integration server. And what happens is it just checks out the code. 
builds the tests, runs the tests. When it's finished with the test, if the tests have all passed and everything's good, then you can simply package it up and deploy. It is really easy. Um, what often happens is that developers will stick what they call a build light, which is a little USB light on the back of the continuous integration server. I think it's, again, fair for you to say you can't deploy a broken build. No matter how big the change is or how small the change is, you can't deploy a pro broken build. Um, and I'm really keen on making sure that it's well known and easy that you can just take the continuous integration and at the end of a successful continuous integration build, just simply make a, make a package file, put that in Puppet's way, or get a cap deploy going with Capistrano. Um, also, there seems to be like a real issue of sitting in the, sitting in the other room, doing the email, never talking to the developers. Um, XP, which is an interesting development in the thought of how to develop projects, talks a lot about getting things working early and getting daily and regular communication. And when I was starting to talk to uh, a couple of DBAs and sysadmins about this, they were like, oh, sit with the developers. Oh, no, I wouldn't do that. I might, get, I might catch something. Um, but it is vitally important that you at least arrive at what they call the ceremony of the XP projects. So if you hear about iteration open and close, if you hear about retrospectives and showcases, retrospectives particularly, that's your opportunity to pitch at the developers. Like, don't miss one of those, for God's sake. Um, and showcases are effectively where you show the people who own the project what's going on. Um, there are stand-ups, which are daily meetings, where all the developers get around and they talk about what they happen, what they do. Um, I've got a DBA across the line to start turning up to stand-ups. And he knew weeks before the deployment exactly what his pain points were going to be. He'd already scripted up the stuff that he needed to do. He dealt with the, the table spaces, particularly because that was a JRuby and Oracle project. Um, and what we started doing was we started making the production config appear as part of the test so we could get the boxes that were going to be production and then we we built against them, we deployed against them, we were sure that they were okay, and then we just simply patched them up the network. So we took them out of the dev area, we put them in SysTest, we had development um, move across, across that. After a while, the testing worked well for that. In the SysTest environment, we, we debugged the issues that we knew we were going to have. Um, we managed to get some load balancers and proxies in there, um, which I think during one of the earlier things I talked about, it's a nightmare if there's just a a load balancer or a proxy that you never heard about before, and it just effectively vapes all your HTTP commands. It's a nightmare. Um, so having that kind of infrastructure there and just simply patched into the right network is such a powerful tool. And it gives this real cycle of success. You've got your hand up. <laughs> were, were you doing releases at the end of each of each? Iteration, because I like that's what I would expect to happen, so that you, you know, you basically get into the routine of doing the right thing, anyways. Like, and it would ease that. We weren't actually waiting until the end of the iteration; we were doing it daily. Um, and the the daily build thing, like, um, even Microsoft managed to get that right. right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so there, there is something to learn from those guys. But certainly, the more regularly you do it, the better it is. And the, the more you'll just, you'll script it up because you have to script it up because you just can't spend the time manually deploying this stuff. Um, there are some particular things that the Ruby and Rails community need to focus on. Um, the dynamic provisioning, there's a lot of libraries starting to appear that use Amazon EC2. So you can effectively start deploying your applications to random remote servers. Um, I have a little bit of concern about that. Seems like it could be a disaster in the happening. But certainly doing that into Zen or VMware environments would be quite interesting and quite cool. Um, and there is not very much SNMP integration. So for those people who do have the big SNMP BMC patrol style deal, um, there's not a lot of support for you just yet. Um, we should assume that one language to rule them all is just a bad idea. I think probably for the next 10 years, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna settle. Even if Rails isn't the answer, then Java or .NET is not the answer either. Um, 
and Ruby needs to deal with the memory leaks. Um, there's a Ruby 1.9 process that is going to turn into Ruby 2. Um, and a lot of work's been done on the virtual machine for that. And there's also a project called Rubinius, which takes a lot of the small talk ideas from the 1980s and implements Ruby in Ruby uh, as much as possible. It's really cool. And one of the interesting side effects of making the language implement itself is that you get a really tight set of um, uh, a tight set of tests around the language because it's so well used. Uh, no, actually, if every time you set up a string as a symbol, that's a memory leak right there. So uh, symbols, um, symbols are effectively fast lookup strings. So if you take a string, uh, string variable, and you put a, a colon in front of it, that turns it into a symbol. That symbol then lands up. I think I'm right in saying um, lands up in static memory, and so it'll it'll never get picked up by the garbage collector. So, what do you need to remember? Um, Ruby and Rails are ice. I've just done a total spruiking job, really, there. Um, the three-tier architecture is really simple to get along with, um, and it's really extensible. And you can stick other things in there, e even if you decide that it's not going to be Ruby or it's not going to be Java. I'm going to stick Python in there. There's no big deal. Um, the REST ideas benefit everybody. They benefit the developers. They make the developers think better. They benefit you because they allow you to take some control over the, particularly the caching and the security. Um, Mongrel is really simple, and you should definitely use it to host apps and use something like Mon Monit to uh, control the mongrels. And Capistrano and Puppet are just fabulous, fabulous tools. I can't imagine why anybody would not want to use those. Um, and yeah, just give the development teams a little bit of a, a poke and say, you know, I want to be involved. I want to be in this. I don't want to be a passenger. A um, couple of photo credits. And any questions? It was that bad, was it? <laughs> yeah, um, as, as a developer who's now a bit of his own sysadmin, like you mentioned that uh, it's a good idea to test, have a test environment where you're testing out your integration builds, but like when I think of integration from a developer point of view, like or as a developer turns this admin, like I don't think so much about integration tests, but integration with existing systems that are going to be in production. So a legacy like point of sale system, legacy database, <coughs> connecting to LDAP, whatever. What about those kind of um, tests, like integration with existing systems that you're going to use in production? Well, I guess one of the things that I really started to notice is that um, the purchase of the, the hardware and the, the provisioning of the hardware started to happen later and later in the projects. And that was like a massive issue because then you didn't get that integration testing. And you couldn't, for instance, sit in a sys-test environment where you could be with um, legacy, legacy kit. So I'm very much a believer in that if you can, if you can mock as much of that out as you possibly can when you're initially developing the application, then put it in a sys-test environment and see whether or not your integration tests make anything else go kaboom, then that's, that's a powerful level of confidence that you can have. And you know, you've know you got to be realistic to some extent and say, well, there, there are going to be bugs and there are going to be things that you're not going to think about. Um, the Samba talk, I think, was quite good about the 28-day bug. Um, that that kind of stuff is going to occur, but at least fewer of them are going to occur. And that's probably the most important point. You're never going to get past bugs, but at least you will manage to squash a few of them before they appear. Anybody else? One of the things that I found as a sysadmin being handed a, a Rails app to basically put on a production server was that they didn't really have anything in the way of startup scripts or stop scripts or anything that could start it cleanly on boot. Um, and it needed a bit of hand-holding to do that. Do you have any suggestions around that? Um, Mongrel actually does now ship with a couple of control scripts so that you can put it into your init process. Yeah, there is a little bit of work to be done there. Um, <laughs> Uh, 
yeah, I, I am, I'm just beginning to love the passenger, but I'm just not brave enough to go. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think Mongrel is a little bit Gen 1, and it is, it's going to, uh, passenger is probably going to fly past it, and eventually that, that won't be, that won't be the, the, the issue that it is today. But I know what you mean, there are some temp files, and there are some things that it doesn't necessarily clean up unless you tell it to. Yeah, there's um, one of the great things that I found was I, I happened to go to Melbourne Ruby Group, and Melbourne Ruby Group had a couple of guys who were doing a lot of infrastructure work, so they were already pointing me down the right route. And I would certainly say that, you know, the Ruby community is about as friendly as the Linux community. You definitely, you will be able to get into it. You will be able to talk decently with people who know know your pain, and will try and help you. If you're loud enough, go for it. Yeah, PHP. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I came away from a situation where, particularly with the PHP stuff, not only was I dealing with bad PHP code, I was also dealing with the fact that I was regularly having to update the mod PHP. And even if you've got something like app to deal with that for you, it's, it's a pain in the backside. It really is. Anyone else? Oh. Oh, have I got time? So you're telling us that uh, Ruby on Rails has memory leaks, and you're also recommending it to be used in a production environment. Yep. Uh, so how do you deal with these memory leaks in a production environment, or a high available? You basically scale over a lot of processes. You stop thinking about it as something that is ex exceptionally long-lived, and you start thinking about, effectively, your Ruby processes as like a little army. And you, you know, if a couple of them get shot, well, that's unfortunate, but it's no big deal. Just, oh, it just gets a little bit slower, and then there are things. Um, there's a tool called Seesaw that you can use that will reconfigure Apache while you're away, and basically drop the uh, drop the mongrel, restart the mongrel, and then put it back in the in the load balancing cluster. Yeah, definitely for for enterprise. But because your your default is like it's a fifty meg process, you can run like ten of these things on a box and not expect it to sweat. Yeah, absolutely. It's like it, it's a really important part of that enterprise story. You couldn't you couldn't put Rails in the enterprise without having something that kept an eye on it right now. Anyone? Go. Cool. No worries. Just to ask about the uh, things to do with runtime, like one of the reasons, like especially commercial Java app services are huge, is they have really extensive runtime control panels where you can check pretty much down to the up detail what's going on. Uh, what's there in the rail side of things? And there are a couple of uh, tools. Uh, I'm quite liking uh, New Relics RPM, 
which gives you a lot of view into what's going on. Particularly uh, for those of you familiar with the MVC pattern, you can check on the controllers and you can see which are your slowest controllers and deal with the, the performance in the controllers. But a lot of it ends up being kind of the classic tools. It ends up being things like SAR and Nagios. Um, and as long as that fits in with the rest of your environment, and the great thing about it is because it's a Unix tool, it does fit in with your Unix environment. Um, it's so easy to deal with. Um, but certainly I'd give, I'd give RPM a little bit of a look. Um, and there's a great tool as well uh, called Hoptoad, which will, when your application chucks an error, um, it sends it up to the Hoptoad website. This is free as well um, and allows you to get an RSS feed of the errors, which is really, really useful.